Good evening. It's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening. Uh, I'm Dwight Perkins, director of the Asia Center, which is one of the sponsors of this event, along with the Asia Pacific Policy Program and the Asia programs of the Center for Business and Government of the Kennedy School. The topic this evening is not no longer on the front pages of the papers as it was in 1997 and 98, at least not in the United States. It probably it still is in Asia. But it is no less important and no less controversial today, uh, even if that is not the case. Our focus tonight, however, is not on rehashing the past. It is on looking at the present uh, situation and looking toward the future. And there are all kinds of questions that we will be dealing with, can be dealing with in the brief time that we have before you. There are, for example, the question of uh, during the crisis, for example, much was made of the relationship between government and business, uh, the so-called crony capitalism, and how that was important for, the, uh, uh, for the bringing about the crisis. The, que the question that obviously arises is, has this situation really changed? Uh, in the recent years, and in fact, could it change given the weakness of the legal systems, the lack of independent regulatory agencies, and the so on uh, that are needed uh, in any economy to resolve uh, various kinds of disputes? One can also raise questions about the political environment and how supportive it is for, uh, for, uh, for a continuation of reforms. Uh, clearly, in some parts of the uh, region, such as Indonesia, it is probably not adequate, the question about the rest of the region. And then there's the whole question of the uh, multi-ton gorilla in the region, China. Uh, is China, as some people fear, going to drain all the uh, foreign direct investment from the region? Uh, or is it, in fact, going to be a positive influence on development in the region? To answer either these questions or any other questions they choose to, to, uh, to raise, uh, we have uh, really an extraordinarily knowledgeable and, and distinguished panel. You have their bios there, but I think I'd just go through uh, some of the relevant parts uh, for tonight uh, here. Uh, first, two of the members of the panel were actually participants, major participants in the, uh, in the uh, Asian financial crisis in the sense of trying to resolve it. Uh, we have uh, Kun Tarin Nimane Hemin, uh, who was serving one of his several times as Minister of Finance of Thailand. Uh, he is currently a member of parliament and deputy leader of the Democrat Party in, in Thailand. Uh, Larry Summers uh, was, as you, I think most of you know, was in the Department of Tre the Treasury as the main person responsible for most of our international uh, policy as undersecretary, then deputy secretary, and then finally as secretary of, of, the, of the Treasury. The two other members of the panel, Mantak Singh Alawalia, uh, who is currently director of the Independent Evaluation Office at the IMF, but before that he has held various very high positions in the Indian government as finance secretary, secretary of economic affairs, special secretary to the prime minister, etc. Dharman Shan Mugaratnam is currently Senior Minister of State for Trade and Industry and for Education in Singapore and a member of Parliament. But much of his career prior to that was in the Monetary Authority of Singapore, in which he ended up with a term as Managing Director until he left in 2001 uh, to enter politics. But in addition to this direct experience with the crisis, uh, we have uh, People on the panel, uh, two members who have actually done substantial scholarship on development issues of various kinds. Uh, Montak Alawalia, when he was uh, uh, at the World Bank, uh, uh, wrote a book that I used to use a great deal with Hollis Jennery, among others. Uh, and of course, Larry Summers was here at Harvard for a long period. Uh, Kun Tarin uh, has a, a business background uh, as well as his political and government background. He was president and chief executive officer and grew, also rose up through the ranks of the Siam Commercial Bank. Uh, Tharman Shamangaratnam uh, has spent uh, much of his career in the Monetary Authority of Singapore, but also, but he began in the Ministry of Education. Perhaps most significant of all for this audience is three of the four have Harvard degrees. Uh, Kun Tarin has, was a undergraduate government concentrator before going on to get a Stanford uh, MBA. Tharman has his MPA from the Kennedy School here, 
having earlier earned degrees at LSE in Cambridge. Larry Summers uh, uh, is, has his PhD from Harvard and was an undergraduate at MIT. And Montak Alawalia uh, is the one exception that will keep the others honest. He went to <laughs> Delhi University and Oxford, uh, um, although he claims to be a, a, a Cambridge spouse because his wife got a PhD at MIT. From the, uh, the, the format, and, this, and then you won't have to hear from me anymore, uh, the format tonight is uh, each of the speakers, uh, the first three speakers will speak for five minutes, and then uh, uh, President Summers will uh, speak for a comparable time uh, as both a commentator uh, and, a, and a speaker, and then uh, there may be some questions that he will raise at that point for the panel and lead to some discussion within the panel. After that, we will go the usual route around the various microphones. Uh, we ask you all, when you do get to the microphones, to identify yourself. Uh, and hopefully, we'll do all that. We'll have time for all of that. And if I shut up, maybe we will. Uh, so uh, I will turn immediately to Mantak uh, Singh Alawalia. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, thanks, Dwight. Um, I've been struck by the fact, both in the conference today and in a lot of the, what's been written about the East Asian crisis that, you know, uh, over time, inevitably, a huge amount of agreement appears to surface. Uh, and I just want to make a few comments on the two or three major areas where, at one level, there seems to be a lot of agreement. But actually, if you look a little deeper, uh, one senses there are different perceptions. And I think that's something we need to think about, because it's going to affect whether the various countries that are in similar positions or even the same countries uh, are really likely to experience similar problems in future. So usually, when, when you hear stuff about the crisis, you, you get a lot of talk about crisis prevention and a lot of talk about crisis management. So I want to make a few comments on each. I think on crisis prevention, there is virtually a universal mantra that uh, the problem was caused dominantly by highly fragile financial systems, uh, weak governance, uh, poor legal systems, which didn't allow for corporate workouts through bankruptcies, et cetera. And in this environment, working in a world of globally mobile capital, countries were bound to get into a situation where they were highly vulnerable. And as a result, there's a general agreement that there should be a huge amount of improvement in all these areas. So lots of work is being done. Most countries subscribe to this. Certainly, I know mine does, and we're going through a great deal of what we call financial sector reform, and virtually every Asian country is doing that. But you know, the problem is that uh, converting from a fragile financial system to one that's really sound is not simply a matter of subscribing to a few codes or setting in place something called a regulatory agency. I mean, it's really a question of developing an entire institution, which essentially means that systems and institutions have to work in very, very different ways. And I would say that, uh, realistically, this is something that would take about 10 years. So the issue arises that even after countries have decided, and I think they have decided, uh, to embark on financial sector restructuring with sound prudential regulation, subscribing to international codes, et cetera, if it really is going to take 10 years or so for credible results to be seen on the ground, I think somebody in this morning's conference for example, said that if we have very poor bank supervisors, it takes about four or five years to train supervisors. So it's not a very easy thing to do. But what do countries do really in the meantime? I mean, are they, in fact, do they remain continually vulnerable? Which really means that while we are doing the right thing in terms of crisis prevention, we shouldn't be surprised if these things happen even in countries that have been following corrective steps. Another worry that a lot of people have is that when, when you start introducing regulatory mechanisms uh, and systems are forced to behave in different ways from what they've been doing in the past, the net effect very often is contractionary. Uh, you don't actually get the same amount of credit flow being directed to better businesses. What you get is, in fact, a contraction in the system. I think this is truly a worry uh, in many parts of uh, the developing world. Um, it used to be thought that uh, by liberalizing the system, which I think everyone is now committed to doing, essentially you would allow foreign financial institutions to come in. And even if the domestic financial institutions were not actually able 
uh, to come up to reasonable levels of credit expansion. Maybe the foreign institution would step in and play, the, uh, and play that role. But you know, all the evidence suggests that this also takes a long time, and that post-liberalization, uh, foreign financial institutions do not actually expand as much and provide as much credit as the contraction that takes place on the domestic side. So this is one, one sort of issue that at, at a meta level, there's complete agreement that we need to move towards a, a restructured, stronger financial system. But the challenge is that if it's going to take 10 years, uh, then it won't necessarily be a very easy adjustment. And in the course of that adjustment, it may not be easy, easy to sustain high growth. And obviously, this problem becomes uh, uh, more problematic if it's happening in a situation where the world economy is slowing down and there are external uncertainties about the pace of growth. So this is, this is, this is really my, ta uh, my worry, if you like, uh, on, on, on the general agreement on crisis prevention. On crisis management, there's been, most of the discussion has focused on the issue of having an institutional underpinning which developing countries or emerging market countries could rely on which would play some kind of a lender of last resort function. And on the other hand, there's this very deep worry that if this goes too far, you generate moral hazard. And I feel that uh, in practice, there is not a good understanding uh, of what the balance between the two is. And if you, if you really go out there in Asia today, probably you find that there is a much stronger demand for a strengthened lender of last resort function which the International Monetary Fund or some other uh, institu some institutional mechanism uh, would have to perform. And, and much, of the, much of the discussion that has taken place in Asia, uh, for example, the Chiang Mai Initiative, which we discussed this morning, regional efforts to provide liquidity uh, linked with IMF conditionality are actually a recognition of the fact that the multilateral system is not providing enough conditional, I mean, enough liquidity. So this raises the issue that have we got the balance right? Um, there's no doubt, uh, nobody disagrees that there is need for a lender of last resort, and nobody disagrees that there's a problem of moral hazard. But once you start asking people, is the balance right, I think you find there's lots of differences of opinion. And I think much of the way the system unfolds, uh, it's really in where you draw the balance uh, that the crux of the debate will be. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Saruman? Uh, Thank you. Well, you know, although the most important part of my career was uh, in financial regulation, uh, for better or for worse, I guess maybe for worse, I agree with most of what uh, Montag says <laughs> on financial, the financial issues. So I think I'll spend my time instead talking about um, some of the economic issues, the real economic issues that uh, East Asia faces. We're basically at a transition point uh, in East Asia in some fairly fundamental ways. I think we're at a transition uh, with respect to the economic models for a new phase of growth. To what extent is export-oriented manufacturing going to remain the key driver in our new phase of growth? What is the new shape of the Asian economic community? And most importantly, how do we engage China? China is the big new fact. Uh, if you talk to policymakers now, if Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, most of East Asia, uh, that's the biggest new fact that we spend time thinking about. Um, how do we adjust to China? How do we seek complementarities? How do we get out of areas that um, we can't compete with China in? It's not fashionable to talk any longer about uh, Pacific, new Pacific century or Asian <laughs> century. But I think what we are really seeing is something very interesting uh, in Asia, the emergence of a new Asian community that's really driven by micro level changes. And the macro analysis does not have very good predictive ability anymore. But at the micro level, decisions by individuals, clusters of knowledge-based professionals, clusters of firms, movements of human capital, and responses by governments to these micro level changes is shaping a new Asian division of labor, both horizontal and vertical. And it's shaping a new Asian social and cultural reality in some ways. It's not just about economic change, obviously, with the change in economic model, a move towards more market-driven and less state-driven economic policies, you, get in, you set and train certain social and political changes. Not easy to predict, and there's no formulaic uh, relationship between new market-based economic models and 
the new political, the new polities that will emerge. But something new is happening in East Asia, and I think it's a very positive new phenomenon. Now, first, China, to answer Dwight's question quite squarely, the conventional wisdom is that China as the new factory of the world is displacing the rest of East Asia in manufacturing, at least, and indeed displacing a lot of the rest of the world in manufacturing. And the other part of the, in other words, the Chinese producer is a threat to the rest of us. Uh, the other side of the coin that's part of the conventional wisdom is the Chinese consumer is a very good thing. In other words, Chinese demand offers tremendous opportunity, but it's largely in services, and it's also in um, resources, in other words, export of fuel and other resource-based uh, industry, uh, industries. It's a, there's an element of truth in this, but it is vastly oversimplified, and it is too macro a perception. At the micro level, something far more complex is evolving, and that is a new Asian supply chain centered on China. Much as we had an old Asian supply chain with Japan, the NIEs, Southeast Asia, there's a new Asian supply chain that's emerging driven by intra-firm allocation decisions, as well as inter-firm cross-border decisions. Uh, new patterns of investment are emerging, new patterns of trade are emerging. If you look at countries like Singapore, Malaysia, in fact, most of Southeast Asia, in the last two years, in the midst of a situation which was either recession or close to zero growth, our exports to China have grown by between 25 to 40% per annum. And even this year, in the midst of the downturn in the tech cycle, our exports of electronic goods to China is growing at between 30 to 40 percent per annum. So something very interesting is happen, happening at the micro level, and it's a new supply chain, a new division of labor. If you speak to any multinational, any reasonably large-sized multinational, they'll tell you, yes, they're shifting investments into China. And that's partly because it's a period of stock adjustment. They were underinvested in China, and you have a period in which you'll have large flows of fresh investment into China at the expense of other locations that they had previously invested into. That's a period we'll have to go through for maybe five to eight years. But any large multinational will tell you certain basic things. First, diversification is important. You don't put all your eggs in one basket for reasons that are both economic and political. Second, internal barriers and logistical costs are a very important issue in the business world. And the internal, internal barriers within China, between different provinces, are very often larger than the external barriers to trade. Uh, I've spoken to specific companies who actually taught, taught this up, compute the costs, and figure that it's cheaper to ex export from Indonesia or Vietnam into the coastal regions in China than from some of the inner provinces in China to the coastal regions. So it is not obvious that China, China, Chinese provinces are simply going to trade with each other as opposed to trading with the rest of Asia or the rest of the world. A third very important micro factor is intellectual property protection. That is evolving in China, but I think it's fair to say that it's not one of China's strengths right now. And it gives an opportunity for many other East Asian countries that have put in place um, strong, not just uh, strong legal rights when it comes to intellectual property, but strong enforcement regimes on intellectual property. There's a whole value chain in manufacturing, and at the innovation part of the value chain, intellectual property, intellectual property protection is very important. Certainly for countries like Singapore, that's how we're positioning ourselves. How do you complement China? by having an advantage at the innovation part of the value chain. The dominant intellectual paradigm for 30 or 40 years in East Asia was something called the flying wild geese pattern of economic development. I think it was Akamatsu in uh, Hitotsubashi, followed by his, uh, his uh, student, uh, Kojima, uh, both of whom subsequently worked under Saburo Okita. Uh, who shaped industrial policy for Southeast Asia in many regards. This was a very neat, simple, and orderly paradigm about uh, leaders and followers, a pattern of technological catch-up, and essentially driven by industrial policy, coming down from Japan to the NIEs to the Southeast Asian countries. Well, the pattern of wild flying geese uh, took a bit of a beating in the Asian crisis. Well, in a sense, it was there, but they were all, all in the wrong direction. Um, <laughs> But it is, it, is a, it is a pattern that is now re-emerging in some very interesting new forms. First, in the knowledge-based economy, cities are going to be able to lead countries. They're going to, it's, it's really new cities and clusters of economic activity within East Asia that are defining this new division of labor. So it's no longer about countries, let alone continental-scale countries like China. China has many different economies. Uh, 
not just coastal versus inland, but it's a whole set of uh, uh, economies with distinct comparative advantages and distinct skill sets. Um, if you look at, uh, if you leave aside Yangtze River Delta, Pearl River Delta, which are clearly, you know, very high in per capita income and capability, all the way down from Liaoning to Zhejiang to Fujian, per capita income probably lower than Malaysia and Thailand, a little lower, but capabilities about the same, about the same as those countries. So many more flying geese entering the pattern. But what's interesting in, is in each of these provinces, you've got outstanding cities in the formation, defined by outstanding universities and clusters of talented individuals getting together. So uh, uh, Talian and Liaoning, uh, Ningbo in Zhejiang, and so on. Every, every major province now has cities which are concentrations of talent. And that's the nature of the new knowledge-based game in East Asia. It's about cities and clusters of firms, leading countries, forming connections across borders in a new Asian division of labor. Not easy to analyze ex ante, but ex post, I think we are moving in the right direction. It's also a pattern of flying geese that's no longer industrial policy driven. It's market driven, rule of law is important, and the quality of education is very important. Mm -hmm. So supply side factors, capability driven factors, and the responsiveness of governments to markets is becoming more important. The, because, I mean, one of my hats in Singapore is education, and I find it, um, in a sense, to be our main economic strategy in the long term. And I think if you look at the middle-tier Asian economies, the advanced and middle-tier Asian economies, Japan and the NIEs, to put it simply, that's probably one of our biggest challenges. We've achieved very high averages in East Asia, if I might say much higher than countries like the States, in educational quality. But we don't have enough peaks. We don't have enough differentiation at the top. We don't have enough grooming of special talents, enough grooming of talents that go their own way and tread different paths. And that's the next challenge for East Asia, to survive and thrive in the service-based economy and the knowledge-based economy. Group creativity, uh, to use a very loose term, is not good enough. It's quite different to be creative in the service industry or in the design type activities compared to manufacturing. <clears throat> requires a different skill set, greater uh, reliance on individual attributes, I should say. And how we can achieve that, freeing up our education systems, creating greater diversity, whilst retaining some sense of social commonality, which has been an East Asian strength, a strength of seeing ourselves as basically sharing the same path to the future with our fellow men, regardless of background, social background, or educational background. How we can achieve that sense of East Asian cohesion as we free up, diversify, and allow for greater individuality is an important social and educational challenge. Thank you. Uh, Quinn McLaren. Thank you, Dwight. Uh, first of all, let me thank, thank you and everybody here for me to have this opportunity to be able to express some of my observations. I really wish I had more time to be able to share with you the crisis management, crisis prevention, laying long-term foundation for sustainable recovery. But since Dwight has mentioned early on that uh, we try to focus on the present and the future, let me focus then on the attempt that we tried in Thailand, because I was in the midst of the action. We were mandated by the people to go and run the government at the time of full crisis in Thailand. So our objectives were quite clear at that time. One was how to stabilize the economy. Two was how to get growth going again. I think we've done those two jobs relatively OK. I think this morning uh, we discussed this particular issue, whether there could be another looming crisis in Asia, or particularly in Thailand or Indonesia, the consensus seemed to be that fairly unlikely in the old traditional sense of a crisis. The risk, if anything, could be that uh, crisis countries in Asia have spent so much fiscal strength trying to uh, save the financial institution and therefore the total economy, and therefore uh, incurring high public debt to GDP ratio, and therefore leaving government with very little room to maneuver in the long run. 
So the formula is quite clear how to get the private sector to run the show as it should. Okay. It's really based upon this premise that how to get the private sector back. And one other consideration that we had at that time. During the crisis, the country has paid so much. The government has paid so much in terms of fiscal strength. Private sector, both the real sector and the financial sector, paid so much in terms of losses and wealth deterioration. And particularly the poor really bear the brunt of the whole crisis in terms of his living standard. So we've paid so much. Really, we must try to do something more than just stabilize the economy, get the growth back. We really should try to lay the foundation for future high quality growth. And of course, going with it, crisis prevention. So really, it's in the context of trying to get the economy to be private sector driven again, out of the necessity of trying to turn crisis into opportunity, considering, uh, considering the cost that we have shouldered. What we tried to do were several things that I'd like to share with you. We've laid down the groundwork that in the future, the coordination between fiscal policy, monetary policy, monetary policy in and by itself would be much better in terms of uh, prudence, in terms of compatibility. Of course, uh, secondly, the financial institution uh, restructuring must go on. Uh, earlier in the face of a crisis, it was financial institution going bad because of a systemic loss of confidence from the depositor side. Now financial institutions challenge is really is going bad because borrowers don't pay. Okay. And therefore they cannot lend, therefore they cannot serve the economy in the way they should. Thirdly, uh, we believe that uh, apart from macroeconomic policy, financial institution policy got to be right. It's very important to tackle the poverty issue really head on. Because uh, without some systematic, well thought out, the right approach to poverty alleviation, I think uh, future development can be really not very smooth for all the Asian countries. And the same would apply for China and India, of course. Fourthly, uh, we believe that basic reforms to get our economic and social structure better interfacing with globalization, increasing competitiveness, increasing productivity is really key. So reforms like educational reform, as mentioned by uh, Minister Taman, uh, judiciary reform, as mentioned by you uh, earlier on. And I would add administrative reforms, which eliminate inefficiency of the public sector, elimination of corruption, which is a big issue at the World Bank. And not in the least, political reform in such a way that further democratization is really well-founded. It's extremely key for Asian economies in the future. Okay. Now, there are certain other areas that we think is also important. Some progress are being made, but remain a lot of obstacle. Regional cooperation, the issue of FTAs, AFTA in and by itself, AFTA with Australia and New Zealand. Now the issue of AFTA and China, AFTA and Japan, maybe ASEAN plus three. These are all the upcoming issues that we need to pursue well, and, and I believe that speed is also important. Um, Sometimes practical steps should be done to achieve the goal rather than talking only merely about the spirit of the change. Unfortunately, AFTA has been weakened a lot because of Asian crisis. 
Asian crisis has weakened four members out of six original AFTA members. And unfortunately, the one of the effects has been that through the crisis years, a lot of inward looking seem to be the mode for these countries. Now we need to revitalize this regional cooperation in a big way. That's, that's what we believe. Finally, in, in, in the sense of uh, change in the international arena, in the international community. Larry, you were really working very hard on the new financial architecture, new international financial architecture. I think we did achieve some uh, something. For example, surveillance, peer review, we did that. Uh, more stringent application of BIS standard, financial sector reform, we did that. But things like how to get private sector to share the loss. I think we talk about that, but uh, it didn't work out. Uh, not, not, not much of progress, I would say. And maybe a small issue, but, but again, we did talk about it, the role of the rating agencies in either enhancing or accelerating or decelerating or stabilizing the crisis. Uh, how, how that would be uh, handled. Of course, the issue of the IFIs themselves, the IMF new instrument, World Bank new instrument, ADB new instrument for Asia. So these are still the pending issues which I think need further international cooperation. It seems to me, Larry, unfortunately, now that the crisis is gone, there is no immediate sense of urgency. The international financial architecture issue and, and strengthening IMF approach or IFI's approach or even regional arrangement started with the Chiang Mai initiative seem to be lacking behind. I, I would pose this as an issue for, for our discussion uh, with the audience. Dwight introduced me as a member of parliament. Uh, let me caution you if you were to ask some question and I need to explain. I need to declare that I'm an opposition MP, okay? <laughs> so please take it in that light if we talk about politics in Thailand. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Larry. In the spirit of uh, former Minister Tarrant's uh, last comment, let me start by saying that uh, no opinion that I express tonight reflects an institutional opinion of Harvard University. <laughs> and let me also uh, be clear that no opinion I express tonight can be taken as reflecting the view of the current U.S. Treasury Department. <laughs> I want to make um, three observations and then pose a question uh, for our panelists. First observation, there's an enormous amount we all have in common. Notice that everybody on this panel agrees that if Asian countries trade more with the world, they will be better off. Everyone on this panel agrees that if they grow more rapidly, their citizens will be better off. Everyone on this panel agrees that if they are able to attract more capital, they will be better off. Everyone on this panel agrees that if they attract more technology and they join more with the rest of the world, they will be better off, and better off in the very profound sense that citizens throughout their countries will live better lives. In light of all the talk about globalization, is globalization good? Uh, should we uh, turn back the clock on the WTO or the IMF? I think it's worth, before we start disagreeing about anything, just highlighting that that basic idea of integration into the global economy being the only route forward is something that's very widely shared. Second, financial systems are fundamental. You know, we think uh, it's useful to sometimes step back and think about what a financial system is all about in the most ultimate sense. And here's the way I like to think about it. You've got people who live in Cincinnati who know that they're going to retire when they get old and want to put aside money today 
and have much more money when they get old. You have opportunities in India or in Thailand whereby putting money into electric, by putting one dollar into electric power today, a society can create two dollars worth of wealth six years from now or eight years from now. Think about it at first. Those two things have nothing to do with each other. And yet, fundamentally, the guy who wants to retire has no way of finding a person who has the productive opportunity. And that's what the financial system is all about. It's about marrying those who want to put aside resources for the future and get more back, and those who have productive investment opportunities. And when you put it that way, you see immediately that how well it works is going to be central to whether an economy moves forward in an effective way. How well it works within a country is going to affect how productive that country is and how well its citizens live when it get old. How well it works internationally is going to affect how fast the poorer countries catch in the world, catch up with the richer countries. And that's why this question of making financial systems work is so profoundly an important uh, question. I think there's one thing, you know, one simple notion that if you keep it in mind, you can at least understand what a lot of the debates are about. And that is that one man's confidence is another man's moral hazard. <laughs> They're both the same idea. You lend money because you feel good. If you, and you feel it'll be OK. If you're for it, you call it creating confidence. If you're against it, you call it creating moral hazard. But it's basically the same thing. And that's why these debates are so difficult. And that's why anybody who takes an absolutist position on the subject is almost certainly taking something uh, silly, saying something silly. Having said that, let me attempt a broad generalization. <laughs> and that is that in the world we have today, at least in Asia, we probably have too much worry about confidence and too little about moral hazard domestically, and too much worry about moral hazard and too little worry about confidence internationally. Let me say what I mean by that. If you know that the place where you put your money, you're going to get your money back no matter what, you don't have any very strong incentive to show that it's being lent out well. That's what brought you the SNL crisis in the United States, and that's what's contributed enormously uh, to problems in Asia. Not only that, the way it's usually put by economists is that if you know your deposit's guaranteed, you won't watch closely enough, and so the bank will be likely to lend money to uh, a project that's too risky, that'll expose to risk, and then it'll set a stage for bankruptcy down the road. That's certainly a major issue. But actually, uh, the economic theory isn't cynical enough. The real worry is that if you're not watching, if your deposit's guaranteed, you won't watch carefully to make sure that the banker doesn't lend closely to his brother-in-law. And it is guarantees that are at the center of corruption. And there is far too much of that implicitly and explicitly in Asia. So when you know that the government's making sure you get your money back, you're not watching that it's being used very well. And when nobody watches things, they don't tend to happen very well. That's the problem domestically. And in a sense, that is a kind of pervasive moral, pervasive moral hazard. We're all feeling good right now about China, but if you ask, Who's watching the Chinese banks are lending money well, lending monies in productive ways? Who's worrying that if the Chinese financial institution lends money badly, they're not going to get their money back? The answer is precious few people are worried because we're so concerned about confidence that we're creating a great deal of moral hazard. Conversely, the balance goes the other way, when you, my judgment, when you think internationally. The system is more susceptible than it probably should probably uh, should be to people to the risk that everybody will decide that a bank is going to fail, uh, 
or everyone will decide that a country is going to fail. And then by virtue of everybody having made that prophecy, it becomes self-fulfilling. And that's the problem of too little confidence. And we probably need to have a system that is more secure against that kind of threat. But these two issues are linked, because as long as there's the sense that domestic resources aren't going to be watched very closely because everything's guaranteed, there is an understandable reluctance to provide too much in the way of funding internationally. And so I think the broad agenda for the next several years lies in twinning these two directions of change towards more confidence internationally and more worry about moral hazard uh, do, uh, domestically. Too often the major forces in the debate have exactly the opposite view. Uh, international officials who preach no more lending, no more large bailouts, no more such packages, and domestic voices who preach, let's get back to doing things the old way, let's get the government more involved like it used to be uh, in the good old days. Third comment, uh, very quickly. Um, transparency is the best protection of all. We've learned in the United States that we didn't have as much transparency as we thought we did. And we've learned that in the areas where we didn't have transparency, we had a lot more sin than we thought we had. That makes the case more strongly for uh, transparency. Almost anything that's transparent is OK, because that which is not OK won't survive transparency and close scrutiny. And so as we think about reform, at least my view is, transparency needs to be uh, much more central. I'd be interested in my colleague's answer to the question, if the international financial community, the IMF, the US Treasury, the, the World Bank, the group of people, private sector, the international community, financial community, could do one thing that would make the prospects of Asia brighter over the next 10 years, what would it be? <laughs> Who would like to go first? <laughs> well, we did talk about this kind of thing before, but uh, my opinion may be one of the few. I think not solving our problem, but warning our problem would, might, might be the, the way to do it. Okay. Not really come in when the crisis happened, but crisis prevention. Uh, this morning, we talked a little bit about uh, the real world issue, not just financial issue. Not everything is central to financial issue. Things like the speculative bubbles, uh, things like uh, inefficient private sector, things like bad governance, as you say yourself, uh, those are the real world. I think IMF can probably be in a position to tackle this issue and advise the member countries better than in the past. That would be my opinion, I think, Larry. I think um, the thinness of Asian markets is a major issue. Uh, that's largely an issue of domestic policy, uh, whether we're serious about developing deeper and more liquid capital markets. But the interesting thing is um, whether this means we need more or whether we need less of the hedge funds and the like. And I think we need more hedge funds in Asia. That's part of our problem now. We don't have enough speculative investors. We don't have enough alternative investors. We don't have enough investors on the other side of the bet. Um, some of the reaction to the initial uh, outbreak and contagion of the Asian crisis uh, was pointing at sort of proximate causes. Who pulled the money out here and there? And there might be some factual merit to that, although even factually, that's quite a uh, murky uh, issue. Um, but if you look at it more broadly and more long term, our problem is thin markets. And you don't get long term investors unless you've got liquid markets. And you don't get liquid markets unless you have short term investors moving in and out, uh, making their own judgments on risk and reward. So I think Asian policymakers have to accept that trade off. That in order to have more liquid markets, which are ultimately more resilient markets, you need a wide variety of players. And what we lack in Asia right now is the variety of players you have in the American markets and increasingly in Europe. The hedge funds, the voucher funds, the buyout funds, 
the private equity investors, we've got to make our markets interesting for them. It's not just banks, and after all, don't forget that banks were the major source of the pullout of capital uh, that, that led to the, the, the deepest part of the Asian crisis. The sudden large withdrawal of short-term banking capital uh, was the proximate uh, cause of the Asian crisis. Answer? Well, it's very dangerous to answer questions about what's the one thing you'd like, uh, because you, know, <laughs> you always end up wanting a lot of things. But I guess uh, not, not talking so much about instrumentation, but you know, it would help if the international financial community would sort of be more aware that there's really a lot more good news coming out of developing countries than the totality of the financial community <laughs> and the media have sort of made out. And I think that in the aftermath of, my own feeling is the reaction to the East Asian crisis has been too negative. Uh, too many people are not aware, I think of what Larry said, that you know, there is a lot of growth that's been taking place and a lot of poverty that's been coming down. There's no doubt that the Asian crisis was a very serious negative blip. Uh, but it seems to me that if the idea is to revive confidence, uh, probably the most important thing is to get foreign direct investment going into these countries. And I'm not sure what it is that would cause confidence to be revived, but a better appreciation uh, that a lot more positive things are happening uh, is probably quite important. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Shall we open it, open it up? Uh, for those of you who want to ask questions, if you'll come to the microphones and following the usual pattern here at the forum, we will just go around uh, each of the four microphones. There are two up on the uh, <laughs> Good. stairs there. Good. Uh, and if you would identify your, your name and you know your Harvard or other affiliation, whatever it may be, uh, before asking a question. And I'd only ask that you ask a question and that it be relatively brief. No, no speeches, please. So. Uh, my name is Rajit Sen Gupta. I'm from the B School. And my question is uh, to a great extent to President Summers, but in general, you mentioned the situation with Chinese banks. Another concern has been people who have been um, estimating China's growth using, uh, for example, power consumption per capita have been coming up with very different numbers from the official figures. Is this another crisis brewing? Uh, is that a so potential source of the next crisis? <laughs> You know, it's sort of a hard question to answer. In a way, you give me two choices. You can have me say, Summers says no China crisis likely. <laughs> <laughs> seems imprudent. Um, or you can say, Summers predicts crisis in world's second largest economy. That also, that, that also seems a tad imprudent under the circumstances. Um, I think there are um, important, uh, important concerns. Uh, in China that center on uh, the health of the financial system. And I think there's some um, work that's been uh, done by Professor Huang at our business school that makes a point that I think is very powerful and troubling in thinking about China, which is that we tend to think of a large volume of foreign direct investment into a country as a sign of strength. But if it's coming because domestic firms can't get access to capital because of financial regulation, if it's coming because high tariff barriers mean the only way to sell to the country is to erect uh, barriers, if it's coming because there's difficulty for domestic companies in functioning and getting approvals in an environment where there's a substantial amount of corruption, then that high volume of investment uh, can actually be interpreted as indicative of weakness of the domestic economy uh, rather than strength. Uh, and so I think some of the reassurance uh, that we may have taken uh, about uh, China has um, perhaps been uh, overdone. Um, but I would, would have to say that um, I went with Mr. Youssef, who's sitting on the first, uh, sitting in the first row, uh, was kind enough to give me my first education as an economist in China uh, when he and I both worked together at the World Bank in 1991. And at that time, I saw substantial risks ahead in the next six years. And it's now been twice that. And uh, that imparts a certain humility. <laughs>
as I offer these judgments. Does anybody else want to come in on this? Or? I just want to make two very quick points. First, uh, on the question of economic growth, uh, I think the scholars now agree that, if anything, China's growth is probably underestimated rather than overestimated. Um, and you know, as a non-scholar, one way to test this out is to do a walking around test. Just visit China and walk around, go to different towns and cities. And I think you get an impression that whether it's 7 or 8 or 8.5, it's growing very rapidly. You can see it in the improvements in the quality, the standard of living from year to year. So I don't know the exact figures, but my scholarly friends tell me that uh, the consensus now is that it's probably underestimated because of the gray economy. But my second point is that there's bound to be a financial disturbance or disruption at some point. We know it. Um, it'd be most unlikely that we have linear growth on the you know, very gradual write down of NPLs. Something disruptive is bound to happen at some point. But what does that mean at the end of the day? I don't think it change, changes the fact that China is going to be a very successful economy. And the reason why it's going to be very successful is because, again, of the micro level. The fact that Chinese individuals, particularly young individuals, are very, very hungry. They're setting their aspirations very high. They have the confidence that they're going to make it. And unlike India, they want to do it in their present lives. <laughs> uh, if we can turn Hi, uh, <clears throat> my name is Ken Ichu Tsuda, a Kennedy School student. I'd like to ask uh, President Samas about Japan. As you know, uh, Japan has been struggling for its non-performing loan program last I 10 know. years. And, uh, and you know, so recently, a Japanese government has revealed uh, the new policy package, so-called Takenaka Plan, under the command of uh, new economic minister, Mr. Takenaka. So I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to know your opinion on the Takenaga plan. And if you have any suggestion for Mr. Takenaga, so I'd like to know. <laughs> <laughs> Do I get 30 seconds or one minute? <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I think the Japanese situation um, points up uh, the dilemmas around moral hazard and confidence. Uh, that I spoke about earlier very well. It is clear that there are hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars in bad loans that in some way are the result of bad lending that is heavily moral hazard and government guarantee related uh, in the past. It is also true that the dominant risk in the Japanese economy right now, to put it mildly, is not overlending. That uh, it is lack of confidence that is by far the larger problem. And so there is a important conflict between the short run and the long run uh, imperative. And indeed, in a recession as serious as the one the Japanese are facing, and in the face of a deflation as significant as the one the Japanese has faced, one of the terrible things about recession and deflation is that in a normal economy, if your business is underwater, that means it should go bankrupt because it didn't get run right and it should get reorganized and repossessed and so forth. When you have deflation and recession of the magnitude that Japan has, your business can be underwater, but it's not the fault of your business. Just like in America, most of the time, if you're unemployed, it probably says something about you. But if you were unemployed in America in 1934, it probably said more about America than it did about you. And that makes the problem much more difficult. So I suspect in Japan that the way forward lies in a combination of macroeconomic policies to effectively combat deflation as a central element in a strategy, as well as structural reform in uh, the banking system. But I've increasingly become a little bit concerned about those who turn to the US handling of the SNL crisis as a kind of textbook example for how to work your way rapidly through a financial system uh, problem. Because I think the overall economic environment in Japan makes the, situ makes, uh, the situation uh, very, sub uh, very substantially uh, more complex. What I think is very important is that uh, Mr. Takanaka appears to be uh, committed to the pursuit of the broad public interest 
uh, rather than as responsive to the special interest as uh, some in his position have been in the past. And uh, so in that regard, I uh, wish him uh, very well and cannot resist uh, noting that he is one who has spent significant time at this university. <laughs> uh, anybody else want to come in on this? Or, uh, our Japan specialists are in the audience. Uh, but yes, on the... Uh, Hi, I'm an undergraduate studying economics. And, uh, thank you. It's an honor to have you here this evening. It, it seems clear from the panelists that uh, global integration is a long-term process. And sort of, I, I'm wondering what the short-term barriers or blips uh, we might be wary of as, as d uh, with regional and global integration. Who would like to uh, start with that? Well, let me give you uh, my practical experience. Uh, when the country went into a crisis and we tried to sustain the openness and the free enterprise type of economy in Thailand, there was a lot of political call for the country to be closed down, to be closed we must keep everything for ourselves. We must rely on our own strength. Basically, uh, reasons given were mainly that, you know, we, we were in ruin because of foreigners. After all, we lost reserve because of that speculation. Okay. Much thought, uh, little thought, was given to the fact that we actually did it to ourselves. And I always said that openly elsewhere, that we openly did it to ourselves. We were prone to speculation. We were not wise enough to handle speculation well. Okay. So the really main struggle uh, for crisis country to come back is really to resist political temptation to be inward looking and to shut down your door, in a sense. It became extremely difficult to uh, restart the engine, re-engage in the international arena, and get into the competitive mode, get into high labor productivity mode, get into the institutional norms of the world. Uh, I, I would submit that uh, the most difficult thing is actually the, the political area. Anybody else want to? We take another question. Uh, uh, My name is Bhakti Merchandani. I'm a Kennedy School student. Um, I was wondering how important or unimportant you think microfinance is in East Asian development, particularly in the recovery from a financial crisis. And if you view it as important, what modifications do you think it could make to become more effective? Microfinance, My microfinance and its role in. Yes, uh, at, at our seminar this morning, there was a contention that uh, financial institutions in developing countries really didn't have the strength or the capacity or even the willingness to serve smaller guys, particularly in the rural area, particularly in the poor community. And of course, uh, looking at the case of, for example, uh, Japan, or some other model countries. SMEs are the backbone to the economy in terms of generation of employment. Okay. So throughout the, the, the crisis years, we gave a lot of thoughts to how to get microcredit going. Microcredit in a sense of creating a financial institution at village level and also financial institution effectively providing credit access to SMEs. These are two different uh, requirements. But again, it, we're talking about a small man type of banks. But I strongly resisted out of really my conviction that when we do microcredit, let's make it a real microcredit. Credit means giving away money on a loan basis under proper risk analysis. It's not giving away money. 
The same is true for SME banks or SME financial institutions. So microcredit should be accompanied by discipline, should be accompanied perhaps by even the villages, let's, let's talk about villages, villages savings themselves, and avoid all the moral hazard of pushing your people actually make the moral fiber, fiber of the community or the rural area uh, villages weaker because you get into a state dependency mode if you are not careful about microcredit arrangement. In short, I think it's extremely important that we start this approach, uh, but we have to be careful. Discipline has got to be there. I'd, um, I'd, I'd agree uh, mostly with, uh, with Minister Tarrant. You know, some of the most moving stories you hear um, about the process of development involve microcredit. There are situations where villages have been transformed by its becoming possible to mass resources to the point where a bicycle can be purchased. And there's an entirely different degree of connection with the rest of the world. Or at a somewhat higher level, where a basic personal computer can be purchased. And there's a kind of connection with the rest of the world that wasn't, poss that wasn't possible before. And there are, you know, if you listen to Muhammad Yunus or others, uh, there are thousands of stories of lives that have been changed by loans of, uh, a, few hundred, uh, of a few hundred dollars. And it's been a wonderful thing um, where it's taken place. And it has been emulated in many, many different parts uh, of the world to very substantial benefit. I think because it is so attractive a notion, it's hardcore, real finance, linked to social development that making a difference in individual poor people's lives, there is a bit of a tendency on the part of some to see it as a magic bullet for economic development and to invest hopes in it that are probably disproportionate to what can be achieved and to try to force feed its scale to a point where some of the benefits are lost. And I think the efforts to advocate these programs have frankly run somewhat ahead of some of the efforts to evaluate uh, these uh, programs. And I think of it as a very important, and in part that's because anyone who comes to a negative view is seen as a kind of spoil sport. Uh, with respect you know, of questionable moral provenance because they're not supporting uh, de uh, development. So I see just enormous potential in it, but, uh, but my comfort level as a policymaker, as an observer, and as an analyst would be increased if there was some more transparency and if there was some more rigorous evaluation. Right. We have, I think, time for maybe, maybe two more. We'll uh, I'm Si Peng. I'm a Singaporean student at KSG here. And my question is to Mr. Uh, Shamunka Ratnam. Uh, we understand that the, the government in Singapore recently announced the key findings and recommendation from the Economic Review Committee in Singapore. Uh, my question is, in your view, uh, would, the rec would the implementation of this recommendation put Singapore in a better position first to respond to any uh, future possible financial crisis in Asia and two, to respond to the rapid economic growth in China. We you hear of you, sir? Well, I'll be very brief uh, because it's a Singapore-specific question. The short answer is yes, I can't say no. Um, <laughs> well, I think it's not so much about responding to financial crises, but about positioning us for an era of innovation-based growth. And I think that's what I was referring to bro more broadly for East Asia, that particularly for the advanced and middle-tier East Asian countries, I think we've exhausted the potential of the old model of growth. And we now have to look for some new formula to sustain growth in a way that growth in areas where there's a premium on innovation, your capacity not just to replicate, but to innovate and do something new. And this calls for a whole new set of attributes. And at the base, it calls for a more risk-oriented culture, a willingness to take risk. And that will take time to evolve. It also calls for government policies that are more supportive of entrepreneurship, uh, more supportive of small enterprises, not just large enterprises, 
Um, and in the Singapore case, which is a point I think specific to Singapore, which is not so applicable to countries like Korea and Taiwan, we need to think harder about local enterprise, even as we continue to attract foreign enterprise to Singapore. And the final question. Hi, my name's Carter Brooks. I'm a student at the business school. And this question is primarily to President Summers. Um, where do you think Korea, given sort of the worries that the press um, about consumer credit and sort of rising default rates fall on that spectrum of moral hazard to confidence? Honestly, the honest answer is it's a good question, and I'm not uh, close enough uh, to the current Korean to the current uh, Korean situation to be able off, to be able to offer you um, an intelligent uh, opinion. Uh, in a contemporary sense, I will say that um, one of the more, perhaps the most impressive acts of statesmanship uh, that I, I've seen is uh, the way President uh, Kim Dae-jung came in and took a set of steps right at the beginning of his presidency at a moment when his economy appeared uh, very, very much uh, to be in uh, very profound uh, difficulty. He took a set of very painful uh, steps that were going to cause him enormous uh, political pain. And he did it with um, dispatch and courage. And uh, that was something that was very impressive. I would just want to say, because I know this is the last, uh, last uh, question, um, that um, these three gentlemen have been uh, substantially modest about uh, what each of them have contributed uh, to uh, their own uh, countries um, over, uh, over time. Uh, Singapore is a country that um, there's plenty of room for debate about a variety of aspects of Singapore's political structure. But uh, in terms of a commitment to professional economic management, um, what Singapore has done has really been an example that has been emulated around the world. If you think about the developments that are substantial for the human race and will be reflected in history books that are written a couple hundred years from now, the fact that India made a very substantially renewed commitment to the market in uh, the 1990s and in the process nearly doubled its per capita growth rate from what it had been before is one of the major stories. And uh, the role that Mr. Alawalia in a variety of government positions played in pushing that along was uh, something that was uh, very, very uh, substantial. First time I met uh, Mr. Tarrant, uh, Minister Tarrant was at a time when his uh, country's economy um, was caught in a kind of uh, economic uh, typhoon. I can't um, remember the precise words about uh, precise words uh, from Kipling about when all of those around you. Um, but uh, Mr. Tarrant was a source of calm stability for his country uh, through a very difficult uh, time period. That was a moment when moral hazard was not the issue and confidence was. And uh, this man was the embodiment of confidence uh, for his country. So I hope you have all heeded what these three gentlemen have said. Thank you. President Summers has spoken for all of us. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we've been privileged to have a very stimulating discussion. Uh, good night, and we'll see you in the future. <laughs>